Now, Damian Martinez is an all-Pac-12 first-team running back who gained over 1,100 yards at 6.1 per clip. And to dive a little bit deeper, it's 6 feet 230. Uh, his numbers, according to Pro Football Focus, in regards to yards per contact are almost exactly what Mark Fletcher produced last year, which were sizable numbers after being hit. Yeah, this is a guy who, I mean, it would be thunder and more thunder if you're bringing in uh, Damian Martinez, uh, a guy who had nearly a thousand yards as a freshman. Uh, so you're, you're talking about 20, just short of 2,200 yards, 17, 16 touchdowns across a couple of years for Oregon State. Uh, you know, a, a smash mouth team that uh, loves to run the ball. And he was very focal uh, in that pursuit for both years that he was out there. 6.1 a carry as a freshman and a sophomore. So like basically proven across two full seasons. You give the man the ball, 6.1 yards is what you're going to get. Um, and yeah, this is a guy where I think that there is space for him at Miami. Um, I think that you give Mark Fletcher firm competition for the number one running back slot now uh, if you were to add Damian Martinez. And like I said, it's thunder and thunder, and it's a little bit of roster optimization. You know, like it's it would be a, 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 a little bit of a protracted trade, right? But initially, the first thing that you had was what? Henry Parrish leaving. And then if you were to, come, you know, get Damian Martinez – Later, you know, in this portal window, like that's a, I love Henry Parrish. And like, I, I always said Henry Parrish was good. I did not think that we should have recruited him over Donald Cheney or Jalen Knighton in the recruiting class that happened a few years ago. I think we're pretty good on that. I love taking him back when he decided to transfer from Old Miss, but I'm going to be honest with you guys. If I had to lose Henry Parrish to potentially get Damon uh, Martinez, I'm doing that trade every day of the week and twice on Sunday. And now you can debate what the degree of improvement is to the overall roster with that move. But I think that even if you agree, if even if you thought that, and I'll just throw random numbers out there, right? Even if you thought that Henry Parrish was an 8.1 and Damian Martinez is an 8.7 player fit, whatever, da, 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 da. But, you know, future eligibility, timeline, da, 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 all those things. Even if it's only like not even a full point of development, it's still optimizing the roster and a small step is still a step. And if we are, if Miami is where we are, sorry, because I'm not there anymore. If Miami is where they are as a program, okay, they still need to take steps forward to get to where they desire to be and where we as fans comment or everybody want them to be alumni, journalists, bloggers, uh, if we want them to have this progression. So a small step is still a step, but, respectfully i submit i think if damian martinez were to come to the university of miami it would not be like a mother may i take you know inch forward it like be mother may i take a, a large step forward i went back to elementary school with mother may i on that one for if, for if you guys are a little bit younger but uh it's not done yet clearly it has been talked about as potential. Uh, so obviously I think that there would be some uh there is some work to do to get him on campus and to make it happen but uh I am thrilled at the prospect of adding a Damian Martinez to this roster. Um, and yeah, you would have thunder and thunder with him and Mark Fletcher uh, at the top of the rotation. And then, yeah, you just sprinkle in a little CJ 2K, Chris Johnson, you know, uh, two time state champion in the 100 and the 200 in high school um, would have been three times, except for he enrolled early from Dillard just saying. So he gave up that uh, Chris Wheatley Humphrey, uh, you know, the Hellcat Ferrari, uh, sorry, well, Hellcats aren't Ferraris, but uh, nicknamed the Hellcat uh, because of his speed on the football field. You know, hey, maybe we put a Ray Ray Joseph on a jet uh, motion. Maybe we put uh, Robbie Wash. Yeah, Robbie, the offensive player, Robbie Washington in some space. Uh, hey, and all and I, I mean, I named a couple of receivers, but that's before you even get Jordan Lyle from St. Thomas Aquinas, because remember, St. Thomas Aquinas has a senior religion credit that you cannot do early. So you cannot enroll early from that school. So a guy who 
might be a more skilled running back than either Chris Johnson or uh, Wheatley Humphrey, either of those Chris's, he would then add into this rotation as well. And then, yeah, you got a six foot, 230 pound battering ram in uh, Damian Martinez. You got a six, two and a half, 230 pound running back in Mark Fletcher, uh, you know, and plenty of options there. Uh, but yeah, I'm thrilled at the potential uh, addition in a Damian Martinez. Again, like I said, first team all conference in the, you know, what was the Pac-12 last year. Uh, yeah, I, I would say that that's an upgrade, no matter how you look at it. Uh, unless you're exclusively looking at how many running backs who are alums of Miami Columbus Senior High School are on the roster. If you are evaluating that, then it is a net negative because you went from one to zero. But, like, come on. Falconer TRX getting us revved up on a Wednesday night. As usual, Falconer, we appreciate you. Super sticker. You're good to see you. Jackson, thank you so much for the contribution there, sir. Jackson says 143 days until Florida Miami renew their rivalry and they are playing for the first time since 2019. Yep. And uh, Miami leads that series pretty clearly off the top of my head. I don't know what those numbers are, but it's a pretty distinct lead in that series. I believe. Um, as I quickly Google wins Pedia, it is actually pretty close. It is 29, 27 Miami. Oh, so those two, but if you look playing... recently, I believe it's been a yeah. lot more Miami. 29, 27, 56 games in roughly 110 years of football for those two schools. So well, they were playing a lot up until the 80s. Yeah, uh, from 1938 till 87, we played pretty much every year. Uh, and then they started crying, so they took us off the schedule. Uh, and then we won four in a row, and then they cried some more, and then they beat us. Uh, Urban Myers team in 2008, uh, beat, you know, freshman, uh, Ja'Cory Harris and a redshirt freshman, Robert Marv, uh, Al Golden beat Will Muschamp in 2013 at the, uh, old geez, what was it called then? Land Shark Stadium, maybe pre-renovations. Uh, and then, yeah, they abused Zion Nelson for 47 million sacks in 2019. And unfortunately, yeah. And that game still went down to the wire. It still could have sure been did. pulled out Yep. at the end. There were like 10 sacks, I think, in that game. Falconer, thank you so much for that. And we've got uh, Paolo chiming in with this one. Thank you so much for the contribution there, Paolo. Any other players you see transferring from Miami? Oh, we lost you. Sorry, I clicked it, but it didn't un unmute myself. Uh, great question, Paulo. Um, at this time, I'm going to run down position by position really quickly. Quarterback, no, because everybody who's not Cam Ward knows that they're trying to stay to battle for next year. Um, I do believe that we will lose somebody, one of the four returners next year, and then add uh, Luke Nickel. <clears throat> Um, who I really like, by the way. Um, and then we'll have a four-person quarterback room going into the 25 season. Uh, running back, we already had one defection. I don't necessarily see any others. Wide receiver, um, I think that the young guys are, are fighting for a chance here, so no. Tight end, no. Offensive line, maybe somebody on second or third team, but probably not. Defensive line, tackle, no. Defensive end, the one I was worried about was Nigel e. Kelly, I hate to say, and then that move just happened. Linebacker, I don't think so at this time because the young guys are going to be fighting for a lot of snaps uh, in the rotation this year and then starting next year. Uh, so no. Cornerback, like, unless somebody just decides that, like, they don't want to be here, I don't think so. Safety, I don't think so either. Specials, I don't. So I quick – Quick run through my head and everything. Uh, I don't see it, um, but I also wouldn't be shocked if a situation were to change and then we did see a little further development along the uh, the roster as a whole. Knox Kane is here. Knox Kane, thank you so much for the contribution. We appreciate you. 
I give Dabo credit for sticking to his morals, unlike Saban, who quit and is now crying because he couldn't outpay everyone anymore. Hey, man. Look, Before you he... jump in on this one, Cam, though, the, the term morals here, I think, is a bit strong. Maybe his principles, his approach, his philosophy. I don't think there's anything moral about it one way or the other. I agree uh, with, with that. I mean, it is uh, kind of splitting hair semantics, but like, I think in that case, the words do matter. Uh, in terms of saving, yeah, he was not getting the saving discount anymore. And look, I said on this show here that even, first of all, I said that they were going to lose to Michigan in the playoff. And I said that the next two lost season was going to be Saban's last year come hell or high water. I didn't know that I was so right that it wasn't even, no, the, not the next one past this one. The next one counting this one was going to be the last one. So uh, I was even more right than I thought I was. But, uh, yeah, the landscape has changed completely, you know. And uh, I, I made the point before, but even with, you know, college basketball, you don't really have these uh, really superstar head coaches anymore. And it's going in that kind of a direct of, of of that same age cadre, you know, your Jim Behans, your Roy Williams is your uh, he's a little bit younger, but like a, a Jay Wright still he even stepped away. And then you're looking at you know Saban and, and others, and you look at the the next group of like elite coaches. You know, Kalen DeBoer uh, is younger, you know, than Saban. So is Kirby. Uh, Dan Lanning is like still like the sixth youngest head coach uh, in FBS. At, well, you know, only 38 years old. And I say that because I'm past that. Uh, you know what I mean? And he's doing great things. But uh, yeah, it, uh, the, the landscape is changing. And then, you know, uh, Saban looked out there and said, you know what? I have all of the success to my credit and all of this money. I'm good releasing what, in his view, and he said it, was the additional stress of portaling and re-recruiting your own players. And I mean, even like a Caden Proctor, you know what I mean? Just like all those kind of, of things. Like it, they, it, can, it can start to wear on you. Like you do something in this realm for that long. Wow. Interesting. That light bulb. Oh. I don't know why to go off. I didn't touch anything. Anyways, um, but yeah, uh, it can it can be it can be tiring, uh, and so now Saban has all the time in the world that he needs to nap. It is a short period of time, isn't it, where you go from whether you're comparing your age to your peers or work colleagues or people of high position or celebrities, authorities, we're talking about head coaches, where you go from a place where well, yeah, you just assume just about everybody's older than you. Everybody's older than me. They're people that they've been around. And then suddenly it doesn't seem that long, much longer. And you're like, I, I'm definitely much more in that position than you. Where it's like, it seems like, man, I see all these coaches that are like 40 years old. I'm like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> The, the real one for me was Gilbert Arenas because we were in the same grade, but my birthday is like, you know, middle end of August. So like I did an extra kindergarten year and his is like early. So like I was 19, like right after I graduated high school and he was like 17. So he's like a freshman at the University of Arizona. And it was just like, that was the one where I was just like, whoa, hold on a second. Like, wait a minute. But hey, a story for a different time. But yes. And here we've got uh, Falconer. I love that, as we all do, when Cam goes off. Hey, man, I I appreciate being the entertainment and also, you know, coming at things from a, a, a reasonable span standpoint. Like, it's very infrequent that you just get, like, pure emotional reaction, which has happened a couple of times on here. Uh, but, like, yeah, I do try to... Uh, I am animated. Like, I, I am unapologetically me. And, like, sometimes that's great or... Like happened at a work event today, I was a little bit too much me, and I had to go uh, apologize to somebody because it rubbed them the wrong way, which, which will happen, but I am enough of a upstanding individual to say, hey, I saw your reaction, and I understood that I what I did was in a, rea was in a reactive way, and 
I apologize for that because like, I clearly see how that landed with you. I see the impact it had with you. So it was not my intent, but I get it regardless. I can own up to it. And oh, look, I came over here because I wanted to apologize to you directly about it. So I'm not sending it through inter any intermediaries or anything. I'm not what I did something that was a foul. Your reaction let me know that. And so I'm here to own up and say that. And you can, be, whatever. You can accept that or not. And I'm pretty sure that person has not accepted that apology. And that's fine. But yeah, I do try to, uh, you know, at least come at it from, from a reasonable standpoint and admit, hey, yeah, overstepped the line, something that was not necessarily 100% whatever uh, accepted or, you know, they didn't land in, in the right way. But I can admit that. Um, but usually when I'm here, I'm right and y'all are wrong. So shut up. I hate to hear not accepted an apology. Hey, it is what it is. And it's not, it is, all I can do is offer the apology and be sincerely uh, and, and, and improve or update my process. And what I'm going to do is output. I cannot make anybody accept that. All I can do is commit to, like, again, taking ownership forward and then moving forward. So, it, and I've said it on here before, people's opinion, other people's opinions on me is none of my business. I did the thing. I apologized for it and I owned up to it. I took, you know, full ownership in front of Pete because it was done in front of people. And my thing has always been, I'm going to accept responsibility and I'm going to try to repair this relationship in front of the same people that I might have ran. Like, I'm not going to like do a thing in front of everybody and then pull you to the side. No, no, no. I'm going to apologize in, the, in front of those same people because you were owed that whether you accept it or not. Hey, whatever. But I did what I could. So, hey. well, that was a tremendous gesture on your part. And I think you're also distinguishing times in which, at least based on my experience, there have been times where clearly I was in the wrong. There is no question about it. I have to apologize to this person. Other times where, okay, I miscommunicated in some way. I never intended mm -hmm. this to be offensive or to be wrong. So a lot of people draw the line there and are like, you know, not my bad or whatever, but it appears in this case, and I've been in that situation where you try to take the higher road and just be like, hey, I, I can see where I would have overstepped or yep. uh, offended you. So I'm going to apologize because of that. Absolutely. And bye. Like I said, I did my thing. And then I got stuck on uh, 95 behind spilled sand. But hey, 